joining us today. Uh, I'm Bill Burns, the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I am delighted to welcome Robert Draper to discuss his truly exceptional new book, To Start a War, How the Bush Administration Took America into Iraq. Robert is the best-selling author of several previous books, including Dead Certain, The Presidency of George W. Bush, and an award-winning journalist for the New York Times Magazine and a number of other publications, covering everything from the rise of the Tea Party to the immigration crisis to barbecue and fine dining in his native Austin, Texas. To Start a War is a consequential book about a consequential moment in American history about how the United States blundered into our biggest foreign policy mistake of the last half century. Having served through that period myself as an American diplomat and having shared in its failures, I consider Robert's new book the best, fairest, and most insightful account I've seen so far. It's hard to imagine a better one. Not surprisingly, given its author, it's a beautifully written and deeply researched book full of rich narrative and thoughtful portraits of the leading players in the drama. It avoids caricatures and one-dimensional portrayals, but it's blunt and direct about the flawed judgments, fear and hubris that led to some tragic mistakes whose consequences are still all around us. Robert rightly emphasizes the importance of more introspection in understanding how American policymakers and so much of the Washington establishment got this so wrong. It's not just about settling, setting the historical record straight, as significant as that is. It's about learning the lessons of what happened so that we don't repeat it. To Start a War is a terrific and timely book, and I urge all of you who haven't done so already to buy a copy or three. You'll see a link on the screen from time to time during our discussion to help you do that. I'll begin today's conversation with a few questions, but promise to leave plenty of time for yours, which you can submit through YouTube's chat function. So thank you again for joining us. And Robert, congratulations again. It's great to be with you, if only in this virtual world. Great being with you, uh, uh, Bill. And thank you so much for that generous assessment of this book. I, I do have to say to the audience that what an honor it is to be um, uh, doing this event with really a legendary diplomat. Uh, and it is axiomatic among journalists that uh, when you're interviewing people um, for a, a, about a narrative in which they were closely involved, that you have to be careful that they will spend most of their time trying to defend or burnish their legacy. I am delighted to report that Ambassador Burns never did that, that he was, if anything, self-lacerating. And it was his perspective, uh, among others, uh, upon which I relied to produce this book. Well, thanks, Robert. Um, why, don't, why don't we start at the beginning? Um, more than a decade ago, as I mentioned earlier, you wrote another excellent book, Dead Certain, about George W. Bush's presidency. Why did you decide to revisit that era now and look more deeply at Iraq? And how did this new book reshape your understanding of what happened? Sure. Yeah. At, uh, at the time that I was researching this uh, dead certain, I'm spending a great deal of time in the West Wing, uh, did six interviews with uh, President Bush. Uh, but Iraq was a moving target. Uh, the company line in the White House was, uh, well, Saddam is, or the Iraq is better off without Saddam. We're going to get this right. Maliki is going to be a great leader. Soon they are going to be um, a democratic partner in the war against terror, and it's going to have an appreciable effect on the Middle East. Uh, it was a lot of that seemed dubious, but it was impossible really to um, uh, to you know challenge those facts at the time. I left that enterprise um, not able to really unlock the central riddles of what would define Bush's legacy, uh, principally among them, uh, just why is it that the president decided to go to war against a country that hadn't attacked us? Um, could uh, did the intelligence really matter? Would better intelligence have mattered? And could anyone? or anything have talked him out of it. Uh, I, I think that there were many excellent books written about the Iraq saga, but none of them really laid a glove or, or fully answered those as well. So I revisited it um, in 2017, during the first year of Trump's presidency, uh, taking stock of this reality TV show guy who uh, has, was a political novice and wondering how in the hell did we get here? And I believed going in that a lot of it had to do with 
a rejection of the expert culture uh, of Washington. And uh, Trump had very much campaigned that way. So, um, uh, so I, I knew then that there would be a kind of relevance to this. And, and finally, Bill, my hope, which was borne out, uh, was that there would be people who'd be willing to talk who weren't able to do so before, particularly people in the intelligence community who happened to still be inside Langley or elsewhere and were forbidden to talk to the press. And I was very, very lucky to track down probably 70 or 80 individuals from the intelligence community who provided so much information, so much um, uh, insight as to the interplay between uh, the Bush administration and the intelligence that supposedly guided them toward war. And that's a really important dimension of your research, I know, Robert. But let me ask you about another striking dimension of of the book, and that is that, you know, in Dead Certain, your earlier book about the George W. Bush presidency, you aptly described both in the title of the book and in its contents, uh, President Bush's pride and his decisiveness and his sense of purpose and his limited appetite for nuance and shades of gray. But one of the most intriguing themes in your book is that um, George W. Bush didn't appear dead certain about the Iraq issue, certainly about going to war with Iraq when he entered office or even in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. So talk to us a little bit about how his thinking evolved and who and what affected him most, do you think? Yeah, thanks, Bill, because I think that's such an important thing to discuss, not only because ultimately this decision is the president's, but because there are so many people out there who really believe that Bush came into office um, determined uh, to go after the man who tried to kill his father in a 1993 assassination attempt. I don't think that that was a principal motivator for going to war. I do think that that uh, constituted a kind of muscle memory for a man who had limited foreign policy experience, knew really as governor of Texas, Mexico, and that's it, um, but knew a little bit about Iraq and Saddam and what he knew he didn't like. Uh, I, I think that, that Bush coming into office um, wanted to be a domestic president. He wanted to focus on tax cuts. He wanted to focus on e education and energy reform. He would have loved nothing better than to see regime change um, in Iraq, but didn't want to invest blood and treasure in doing so. The calculus changed for him after 9-11, uh, um, an event for which he was unprepared, though frankly, he should have been prepared because he received a lot of briefings on the subject. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think it he doubled down in his determination after 9-11 to make sure nothing like that happened again and began to look around for where the next wave would come from and who would be involved in it. Uh, the notion took hold sometime that, um, that though this appeared to be an attack just done by Al-Qaeda, that, um, that things could always be worse. Al-Qaeda could uh, confederate with a rogue nation that possessed weapons of mass destruction and unleashed biological and chemical weapons. And when Bush began to look around for who would do that, he looked no further uh, than Saddam Hussein. And I and so it's he mentions, as I detail for the first time in my book, that that um, nine days after 9-11, he's meeting with religious leaders in the Oval Office and he confesses to them, I'm having trouble con uh, controlling my bloodlust. And uh, later that evening, uh, just before giving uh, his uh, powerful speech before the joint session of Congress, he meets with Tony Blair and other um, uh, of, of Blair's British cadre, and he talks to them about this as well, saying, you know, the, where, where I come from, the America that I live in, uh, they're, they're, they're angry. They, they, they want somebody dead. They want, they want a country uh, bombed. They want it day before yesterday. Bush managed to contain his bloodlust, but he continued to lean into the idea of Iraq, which I draw a sharp distinction uh, with from um, he was determined to go to war from the outset. In other words, I believe that though his mind was close to being made up, if anyone had made the effort, they probably could have talked him out of it. One of the most, you know, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, Robert, that one of the most um, important, but oftentimes most infuriating characters in the book is Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, he was hugely experienced, as you describe in the book, supremely self-confident, very smart, as bureaucratically agile as any cabinet officer in a long time. Um, but he also sometimes seems in your account like a control freak who relished monopolizing control and vanquishing bureaucratic rivals, but less concerned sometimes about exercising that control or taking responsibility for it. 
You know, one example, as you describe in the book, is his determination to monopolize post-war planning. Um, but when the post-war moment came, sometimes acted as if it wasn't his problem. And he didn't seem to share the ideological convictions or ambitions of some of his senior deputies, like Paul Wolfowitz or Doug Feith, um, you know, about the notion of remaking the Middle East by toppling Saddam. Um, so talk to us a little bit about Secretary Rumsfeld's role and, and what you made of it. Yeah, I think you could teach an entire government course um, on on Donald Rumsfeld. I think, you know, public policy people could do so to show the limitations of, among other things, experience and expertise. After all, Rumsfeld had served as Secretary of Defense before in the Ford administration. He'd been chief of staff as well. This is a guy who seemed on its face to be supremely qualified. Um, for the post of Secretary of Defense under the second Bush administration. Uh, on the other hand, he'd been out of government for a long time, uh, and, uh, and the issues that he was about to face were issues that he'd never confronted before. But I think more than that is something that you just alluded to, Bill, was the character of Rumsfeld, a guy who tended to um, be more interested in poking holes in other people's logic and in other people's policies than in recommending policies himself. He was a, a, a real bureaucratic kung fu fighter uh, who um, uh, constantly clashed with people like uh, Chief of Staff Andy Card and Condoleezza Rice. Clash is uh, probably a kind way of really just saying he, he treated them with total disdain because they stood in the way of what he perceived as the chain of command between the Secretary of Defense and the Commander in Chief, George W. Bush. Uh, he resented them being anywhere near any, uh, any discussion he'd have with Bush. He didn't think it was proper. These are the kind of things that really preoccupied Rumsfeld far more so than um, policy objectives. And you pinpointed one that I think is was really um, consequential, and that was the insistence on the part of Rumsfeld and his subordinates that the Pentagon be in charge of post-war Iraq. Uh, the paradox is that uh, the the main interest in Rumsfeld was making sure that you guys at the State Department weren't in charge of post-war Iraq, not so much his own notions of what post-war Iraq should be like and how they how they should implement a kind of post-war Iraq. Quite the contrary. Rumsfeld made it clear over and over that in his view, what they needed to do um, was, as he put, would put it somewhat patronizingly, uh, take the hands off the bicycle seat and let the Iraqis learn how to ride the bike themselves. It was axiomatic and constantly uh, said in the Pentagon that we don't do windows. And in saying that, they were sort of jeering at the Clinton administration during Kosovo and Bosnia and this caricature of American soldiers walking kids to school. Um, that was what they believed, you know, a fighting machine is not supposed to do. And so, um, when post-war Iraq happened, uh, for um, the reasons I've mentioned and other reasons as well, uh, the, uh, the U.S. government was woefully ill-equipped. Uh, it's hard to say whether whether the State Department um, had itself uh, the ideal plan for post-war Iraq. I think you you can speak to this, you know, Bill. But my impression is that state's real plan was to. Um, uh, prevent this eventuality at all. You know, that, that, that certainly if that were their preference. Uh, and and um, Secretary Powell warned the president of all these, you know, second and third order consequences if we did invade. But it's nonetheless a case that, that um, the Pentagon under Rumsfeld um, uh, really, really dropped the ball when it came to post-war Iraq. And, and it's hard, I, I think um, you can still make the case that we had no business going in Iraq to begin with but it's also possible that you can make the case that if we had done so, there was a way to do it to minimize some of the damage that came after. I think that's a very fair point, but it, it also leads me to a question about, you know, Washington always has its share of policy entrepreneurs outside government. And in this case, Ahmed Chalabi in particular, but a number of other, you know, exiled Iraqi oppositionists played a role. How big a role do you think Chalabi played in the decision to go to war including in sort of setting the stage for it, because, you know, he was a prime mover behind the Iraq Liberation Act going back to the late 90s during the Clinton administration, which had bipartisan support. So how about how big a role do you think people like Chalabi played in shaping expectations about what the aftermath would look like and, um, you know, how easy or how hard it would be for Iraqis to play the role that, as you suggested, Secretary Rumsfeld uh, thought they ought to play immediately? 
Right. Well, there's a there's a book out there called uh, The Man Who Took America to War or something like that about child abuse. I think that's a gross overstatement. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't take America anywhere, uh, but he certainly did um, uh, feed a mindset that was very, very hospitable to the notion of going to war, of overthrowing Saddam. And what he would say throughout the 1990s was it can be done cheaply. In fact, um, uh, 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 Iraqis will um, will quickly and joyously coalesce around a post-Saddam government uh, and uh, it was strongly implying that he, Ahmed Chalabi, could be the leader of that government. He also would tell anyone who seemed to be eager to hear this kind of information that, uh, uh, that a post-Saddam Iraq would be um, uh, a real ally and even friend uh, to Israel. And uh, that was music to the ears of, of, of some folks on the Hill. And, um, and then Chalabi uh, um, uh, began to, to have an influence in other ways, which was that after 9-11, he began to feed information to the media, as well as to the office of the vice president of the Pentagon, relating to the threat of Saddam. And he would, uh, or, or, or um, the threat that comprised Saddam, that, that, that Saddam was hooked up with Al Qaeda, that, um, that Saddam was in possession of all these deadly weapons. And he was doing this on a made to order basis. Like right after, I, as I mentioned in my book, Chalabi uh, happened to be in California in 9-11, and word comes back uh, from the Bush administration that, hey, we're eager to know about um, Saddam's uh, possible involvement in 9-11 and his links to terror groups like Al-Qaeda. And Chalabi said, in effect, on it. And, his, and he and his people, as soon as they got to D.C., started disseminating information, though much of it was half-baked, if baked at all. And then later, uh, when it was said to Chalabi that actually what we're now really interested in is information that um, Iraq possesses weapons of mass destruction, Chalabi again began to disseminate that frequently to members of the media who were far more credulous than they should have been. What do you think the role, you, you write about this in one of the chapters in your um, terrific book, and again, the book is To Start a War, How the Bush Administration Took America Into Iraq, but in, in one chapter, you deal with that issue of the role of the media in the run-up to war in Iraq. Talk to us a little bit about that as well. Sure. I mean, obviously, I'm speaking to you as someone who's a frequent contributor to the New York Times Magazine, and the New York Times has a lot a lot to answer for this, frankly, uh, because they um, uh, they published a lot of things that turned out uh, not to be at all true. Uh, and uh, Judy Miller has been singled out for criticism, but she was not the only one at the Times. I think there are two or three reasons for all this. And, and uh, one of it is that uh, um, the usual competitiveness and eagerness for scoops. The other is that 9-11's uh, um, uh, chief, uh, uh, you know, victim stage, as it were, was New York City. So a lot of people who worked at the Times knew people um, who had been victims. Uh, and I think they felt a real civic obligation to help prevent the next attack. And I think they leaned into uh, some of the conclusions as well. And finally, and this is not true just of the New York Times, but of a lot of folks, a lot of these people had, had uh, covered Iraq before, both during the Gulf War and, for that matter, the previous Iran War, uh, in which um, Saddam used chemical weapons against his own people in Halabja and elsewhere. Uh, they knew that this was a bad dude. Uh, they, they figured, why give him the benefit of the doubt? And I really do think that those experiences clouded their judgment. Uh, they, uh, they weren't going to cut Saddam a break. They were going to err on the side of his being guilty of something. It is impossible to say, uh, Bill, whether a more skeptical medium uh, would have slowed this train. Um, uh, but uh, what's, what's pretty clear is that they weren't sufficiently skeptical. And, and there were corners of them who were. There were you know, people on the left who were. There was this plucky uh, group of reporters from Knight Ritter uh, who, from the get-go, uh, right after 9-11, began to receive the same kind of tips that the Times and others were getting. But they actually questioned you know, the, the source. They, they wondered, these, why are these guys talking about Saddam right now? What's, what's going on here? And, and they proceeded with a view that there is an agenda here and, and that these kinds of tips should be viewed with a heightened sense of skepticism rather than leaning into them and, and, uh, and you know, being as credulous as they were. So all of which is the way to say that I think that um, we don't know if the media could have stopped the war, but they provided the closest thing there is to a glide path and, and, uh, and printed uh, on the front pages of, including my newspaper, uh, uh, intelligence scoops that simply turned out to be totally inaccurate. 
Robert, you mentioned this earlier, but you know, one of the most fascinating dimensions of your book, of your new book, and you know, one of the most original areas of your research has to do with the role of the intelligence community, because you know, as you mentioned, you were able to interview a lot of people that you weren't able to talk to. And, you know, when you were doing the first book about the George W. Bush presidency, and now, obviously, as, as you mentioned, you had a lot more people who were out of government and willing to talk about their experiences. Um, so describe for us what you found, um, you know, as you look at the role the intelligence community played um, and, and how that affected the path to war. Sure. It's it's worth remembering that the director of the CIA, George Tennant, was a Clinton holdover. He was the only one in the Bush administration who was that way. And he was viewed, rightly or wrongly, as, as vulnerable as a result, particularly after 9-11, when there was a concern that Tennant and the agency would be the fall guy. And indeed, the agency did come in for some um, justified criticism regarding 9-11. Uh, but uh, uh, then came, you know, in, in the... Um, uh, trying to prevent the next attack. There came all this discussion about Saddam and perhaps his ties to Al Qaeda. And the CIA, by and large, pushed back uh, vigorously against Scooter Libby, Paul Wolfowitz, and others in the administration who were determined to draw that connection that the agency just believed did not exist. It, it took, I think, a lot out of the agency to do that. They more or less succeeded. I say more or less because while the argument kind of stopped on that score by August of 2002, in a way, the mission was accomplished because um, George W. Bush believed that there that Saddam could confederate with um, with Al Qaeda, and um, and seemed uninterested as to whether or not um, that was truly plausible. He just believed, you know, evil doers get in bed with evil doers, the enemy of my enemy, etc. Then, though, came the discussion as the discussion turned to Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. The CIA then, I think. Um, really crossed over a line. Um, they, by this point, uh, after having exhausted themselves, pushing back against uh, this notion that Saddam was in cahoots with Al Qaeda, now came to an area of general agreement. They did believe, the, um, uh, the agency did, that Saddam had an active weapons program, might well have a weapons stockpile. They, they didn't know this, by the way, uh, contra the claim of uh, Vice President Cheney in August 2002 that simply stated there can be no doubt Saddam's got weapons of mass destruction. They, they bridled uh, at that, um, but that was their belief. And then when the Bush administration basically started saying to Tenet and to the CIA, we want to amass a case for war, we want to state that case, um, what happened then was that these assessments uh, in the intelligence community that were only that, with certain, with varying degrees of confidence levels, now became statements of fact, most notoriously in the February 2003 speech before the UN by your boss, Secretary of State Powell. Uh, and along the way, it was more or less forgotten, or at least um, pushed to the margins, that these were really only educated guesses. And that, and that as many people inside the Langley headquarters knew, uh, these guesses were really fraught. They, they, they relied on uh, sources uh, who the CIA hadn't been in touch with in, in the notorious case of Curveball, the promulgator of the biological, um, uh, mobile biological labs, Intel. And, um, uh, and in other cases, uh, based on outdated information, uh, extrapolations, and, and, with, and operating on a basic assumption that Saddam had weapons before, uh, he's bound to have them now. But even more ironically and infuriatingly, Bill, and I'll conclude with this, um, they, they were based on the assumption that we're going to go to war anyway. And if we're going to go to war, let's not, you know, our soldiers need to know what kind of uniforms they're going to wear. Should they be wearing, you know, uh, anti-chemical weapons, uh, mop gear? And, uh, and um, if we assess that we're not sure that they have chemical weapons, we could have blood on our hands. So better to be prepared for the worst and say that, that Saddam, yeah, does have chemical weapons right now, which led to a kind of circularity uh, that the Bush administration would then point to that as saying, see, Saddam is a threat, when really they were only making that assessment because they were concerned that if we did go to war, the soldiers would be unprepared. Now, circularity is a good way of putting it sometimes and the, and the way that seemed to work. Uh, let me ask you, Robert, just to take a step back again to something that you said earlier in the conversation. Um, you know, 9-11 was a terrible jolt uh, to a White House, which had come into office uh, 
um, focused primarily on a domestic agenda on how do you translate compassionate conservatism um, in terms of domestic policy and very much to restraint in foreign policy in the pre 9-11 um, period in the first term of the Bush administration. But then, of course, came 9-11. To what extent do you think Iraq, I know this is an overgeneralization, but was in a way a kind of overcompensation for under-preparation for 9-11, at least in the minds of some key decision makers? Oh, I, I, I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, the principals like Condoleezza Rice, you know, made clear to me that they were not going to give um, uh, they, they were not going to wait for, as she famously said, for evidence to come in the form of a mushroom cloud, that they were going to assume the worst. And they certainly did assume the worst with Saddam Hussein. I mean, uh, Bill, you know, this, I should mention to the viewers uh, about this letter that w that ultimately made its way to you um, that came from Tariq Aziz, the deputy prime minister of Iraq. I think he wrote it on September the 17th or so, uh, sent it to um, Frank Carlucci, uh, who had worked in the Reagan administration and who then forwarded it to you and then a subsequent letter from Aziz. These letters basically said, um, look, you know, okay, uh, uh, pardon my boss's lousy language about September 11th, you know, he said some nasty things, but the truth is we want to be allies in the war on terror with you. We're natural allies. We hate Al Qaeda too. These Islamic extremist, extremist groups have attempted to assassinate both me, Aziz, and Saddam. And uh, so we would like to start a dialogue. Now, one can make too much of these letters. I mean, I, I, I could understand why you didn't like, you know, go over to Secretary Powell and say, we've got to meet Aziz right away. But it does establish a frame of mind. And it's a frame of mind, um, uh, a posture by Iraq that certainly is not that of somebody who is determined uh, to go after us. I mean, you can, you can assume that Aziz was a bold-faced liar. On the other hand, Iraq's ambassador to the UN had been saying this kind of thing to the, to the CIA throughout the 1990s. Um, and again, one still doesn't have to get in bed with a dictator. One can decide not to have anything to do with him. But it is a window onto Iraq's thinking that is certainly a sharp contrast from this uh, assuming the absolute worst that he wanted to attack America's homeland. Yeah, and in a sense, Robert, I mean, as you know, as well as I do, those two things aren't mutually contradictory. I mean, you can assume rightly that Tariq Aziz is a bald-faced liar and be deeply skeptical of, you know, you know, what he was trying to suggest in that letter. On the other hand, um, you can also um, see clearly that, you know, at that point, I think, you know, Saddam was not intent on a direct attack on United States interests as well, that his preoccupations were more with predatory neighbors and insecurity about his position at home as well. And, you know, in that early period of the immediate aftermath of 9-11, I don't only speak for myself and those of us around Powell, we just didn't think that there was going to be any, you know, rush or move to conflict with Saddam Hussein. The priority was, you know, clearly in Afghanistan and what had just happened in 9-11. And, you know, that in a way created a lot of other, could have created a lot of opportunities. I mean, for example, you know, we had, after 9-11, the attention of Muammar Gaddafi was very sharply focused on his own future. And, mm -hmm. and the Bush administration, to its credit, was able to use that to, basically get him out of the business of terrorism and give up a rudimentary nuclear program. So, you know, people were, you know, aware of those possibilities and the opportunities that created. Um, it's just that none of us, at least in the State Department, assumed that Iraq was then going to be the, the, the sort of focus of American foreign policy attention. Well, and Bill, I should add that the CIA didn't either. I mean, it left out of the whole discussion that, oh, the CIA got all its intel regarding WMD wrong is the fact that even as the CIA believed that Saddam had an active weapons program, they didn't believe that that made him a threat to America. And they said so repeatedly. John McLaughlin, the deputy director of the CIA, went um, to in, in close testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee, was asked point blank by the chairman, Carl Levin, uh, do you think that, that Saddam would unilaterally on his own attack the American homeland? How likely do you think that would be? McLaughlin's reply was not likely. And then uh, Levin followed up by saying, how likely do you think uh, Saddam would be to attack America if we attacked him first? And McLaughlin's reply was very likely. McLaugh uh, um, Carl Levin then immediately had that portion of the testimony declassified. It infuriated Condi Rice to see that McLaughlin had said what he said, and she she yelled at, at Tennant on the phone, and Tennant promptly released a statement saying that, that there is no distinction at all between 
us and the White House when it comes to the the evolving threat of Saddam Hussein, which was untrue and really infuriated um, people in the agency. It goes to show you the kind of political pressure the tenant was under. But the true view uh, expressed by McLaughlin, but also others, was yeah, he may have weapons. That's true. But a lot of people in this world have weapons, and that doesn't mean they're going to use them against the U.S. No, I, I think you got that exactly right in terms of the views that you know I heard at the time from people and many people in the intelligence community as well. Um, let me ask the, a, a question about um, consequences in a way. Now, two decades later, um, and ask you to talk a little bit about you know the consequences that you see in today's Middle East to the decision to go to war in Iraq, but even more than that, something that you've talked and written about a lot, which is you know, the sort of consequences in the American political system for the disconnect between, you know, the Washington establishment and a lot of American citizens um, about the suspiciousness increasingly toward, you know, expertise and, and institutions in a way that, you know, Donald Trump clearly has tapped into um, in 2016 and the years since then as well. So can you talk a little bit about what do you think those longer lasting consequences have been, not just in the Middle East, but in terms of the American political system? Sure. In fact, I'll speak less um, uh, to the Middle East because you're more expert on that than I am. But what I will say is that uh, today we have 5,200 troops in Iraq. Um, there are protests in Iraq relating to the corruption of the government um, at our military base. Uh, uh, ISIS bombed it recently and there were three American casualties. Um, the current prime minister, al Qadimi, uh, was the preferred choice of the Iranian government. There had been predictions in real time, and I believe you were probably one of the people issuing these predictions, Bill, that, that uh, uh, the chief beneficiary of, of um, uh, a, a toppling of Saddam could well be Iran. Uh, the Israelis, by, by the way, thought that as well, as you likely know. Um, uh, there, there perhaps were a few who would love to see us go into Iraq, but their concern was that this would only embolden Iran or increase their power, and that has truly come to pass. What we are envisioning right now in Iraq may not be a fate of, may not be etched in stone. There surely will be changes, but it is not what anybody envisioned um, 17 years ago when, when we invaded. That's the foreign scene. Domestically, I think you're right that, that um, for one thing, the presidency of Donald Trump is unimaginable, but for what happened in Iraq, he separated himself from the Republican field by basically looking at uh, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and Jeb Bush and, and uh, others who had a great deal more experience than him and then said, in, in effect, what did all that experience get you? What did all your expertise get you? You guys don't know anything. You brought us into this endless war and you're still defending it to this day. That's made possible uh, a, a, a kind of um, downplaying and, and even marginalization or denunciation of, um, of expertise in, in America. It also, I think, has led to uh, the ability of Trump, a, a, you know, a, a chronic um, uh, confabulator, to be able to produce what Kelly and Conway memorably described as alternative facts um, and um, uh, to, to create his own reality and to say that the deep state uh, which enabled this war, which is kind of hilarious because you would have been deep state and, and uh, uh, that, uh, that these are the people not to be trusted, that, that uh, you know, I alone can fix it, I alone am, am saying what's true and everything else is fake news. But you, you do raise a fair question, Robert, about expertise, which, you know, obviously is extraordinarily important in, you know, any profession or dealing with any set of issues, not just foreign policy or national security. But you know, as you've pointed out before, it has its limits. In other words, you need, you know, people who are career experts who are willing to question their own judgments and not just kind of make lazy assumptions about historical analogies, something that's always a lot easier said than done. But as you look at, you know, back now um, at the experience, almost two decades now of the, of the run up to the war in Iraq, to what extent do you think the lessons of Iraq and the war in 2003 and the subsequent turmoil have been absorbed by the national security policymaking community, by the intelligence community? I mean, I know that's a hard question to ask in the Trump era with the White House that's so disdainful of process and disdainful of introspection. But how concerned are you, just to offer one example, that you know we can repeat some of those mis same mistakes in the current administration's approach to Iran today, for example? Yeah, no, sure. I, I'm deeply concerned about it. And, and as to the you know um, 
who, if anyone has learned from all this and really internalized the lessons of Iraq, I do think there are two institutions that have. One is the Army, uh, the, the U.S. military. I think the Army War College's uh, lessons learned uh, relating to Iraq is, is a huge public service to the U.S., but also a, a clear demonstration of the military's willingness uh, to learn from all its errors, particularly as regards post-war, you know, post-war Iraq. The other is the intelligence community, which still isn't perfect. I think they have still uh, a lot of challenges vis-a-vis -vis collections. But in terms of the analysis, uh, and, and these were clearly analytical failures, you know, in addition to a, a limited collect, you know, a limited um, existence of intelligence. I think that they've done a lot of introspection, and and um, and you know, if anything, we're seeing right now in the Trump era so an over caveating. You know, lots of uh, uh, well, you know, we don't have a consensus on whether or not the Taliban is is uh, receiving these um, uh, bounties from, from Russia, uh, and uh, so at times I worry that that uh, you know the IC is issuing just kind of um, you know overly compromised gobbledygook uh, under the you know, wilting under the pressure of the Trump administration. But I think that, you know, the broadly speaking, Bill, the, you know, the, the lesson is something you alert, alluded to, which is that experience gets you only so far, um, particularly if that experience does not, is not accompanied by a willingness to follow the truth. And, and I think that, that after 9-11, um, which has often been described as a failure of the imagination, um, the, the Bush administration, led by the president, came to over rely on imagination, you know, and, and uh, began to think of the darkest scenarios, began to imagine a confederation that didn't exist, imagined Saddam as an existential threat when he was not, when no evidence supported that. And it, it, it very, very, at very few points was there a halt. Let's, let's, Let's take a hard look at the facts here. Let's see where they lead us. And that in turn will, you know, uh, hopefully shape our decision whether or not to go to war. I, I do hope that that lesson has been internalized, but I fear that it is not. And that in some ways, that's the most important point of all is to, and most important point of your book is to drive home, you know, the, the value of introspection and, and to absorb that lesson, just as you described so well in the book. I, I promised that I wouldn't monopolize this conversation, so I do want to turn now to questions from our viewers, from our audience. And the first comes from Vijay via YouTube, and it is, can you talk about Vice President Dick Cheney's influence and role? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Obviously, there, there are some who believe that Cheney basically was the grand manipulator and, and Bush was the puppet, and I think that um, that is a that's an overstatement, but it is nonetheless the case that um, as Bush was uh, uh, maintaining that his mind was still open, his decision space was closing, and and the part of the reason for that were were the energies on the part of the office of the vice president and the Pentagon uh, to create an atmosphere where the darkest scenarios were the were the conversation of the day. Cheney, I think, came by his views honestly. I mean, he he was the Secretary of Defense under Bush 41 during the first Gulf War. He supported uh, then President Bush's decision uh, to pull the combat troops out of Iraq, not to uh, after having uh, succeeded in routing uh, uh, them from Kuwait. That was, after all, the mission, and he felt that it was accomplished. And Cheney was fine with that. Um, as the years progressed, he, he was sorry to see that Saddam had not been overthrown, came into Bush 43 uh, uh, with, still with some chagrin, but also recognizing that this new president had a domestic agenda, wanted to focus on that, and, and Cheney was respectful and didn't try to push Saddam onto, um, onto the agenda. 9-11 changed everything for Cheney in that regard, but in a sense, it, it was an honest change in that I think Cheney really became preoccupied with, with the fear that a biological or chemical attack on the homeland um, could result in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, and that if Al-Qaeda got those weapons, that this would be uh, an existential crisis, and, and he began to view Saddam as the deliverer of that. Where I do fault Cheney is um, that by the summer of 2002, uh, he had utterly taken flight from all of these kind of caveated assessments from the CIA about Saddam's weapons program, and was just cavalierly saying, uh, there can be no doubt Saddam's got him. And there was plenty of doubt, and, and there was no evidence, and, and Cheney continued to say as such, and in that sense, I think that, that he um, was intellectually dishonest, but also very, very influential in the push to war. And how would you contrast, just to, to follow up on that for a second, mm -hmm. Robert, the you know, that sort of view of Vice President Cheney toward 
war in Iraq and the toppling of Saddam Hussein and the assumptions of other prominent players like Paul Wolfowitz, for example, about, you know, what was the purpose of war and what might it, what might it's, you know, it unlock in terms of other possibilities once Saddam was toppled. Right. Now, it's it, actually um, in that very speech that I mentioned where Cheney says there can be no doubt Saddam's got weapons, he also quoted Fawad Ajami saying that uh, the, if once liberated, um, the streets will erupt in joy and candy and flowers will be thrown everywhere. I don't know that that was, you know, Cheney's not the kind of guy to really like be harping on that sort of idealism, idealistic notion, the way that, say, Paul Wolfowitz would. Cheney's view was more that um, uh, in the past, uh, when terrorists had attacked America, whether it was the U.S. embassies in Africa or um, off the coast of Yemen uh, at the USS Cole, that we had not responded sufficiently. They basically knew they could get away with it. And unless and until we projected force uh, that, um, that uh, those extremist groups that wanted to do America harm wouldn't learn a lesson. It was for that reason, I think, as much as the concern about the American homeland being attacked, the Cheney believed that we needed to go in. Mm -hmm. We have another question from uh, Matthias, again via YouTube, um, who asked about another really interesting dimension of the run-up to the war, which you, you write about um, quite eloquently in the book, and that is, could European countries have done more to help the United States do a better job managing the post-war era? And if I could add to that, you know, talk a little bit about your impressions of the role of Prime Minister Blair and the UK, you know, in the run-up to the war, because uh, obviously he was the, the, the one sort of staunch or one of the staunchest European allies and supporters of President Bush through this period in the face of, you know, a lot of resistance from the French and the Germans, um, to cite two other examples. So just if you could talk a little bit in general in response to Matthias about the role of the European countries, especially with a view toward post-war. Right. Um, and then second, about the role of Prime Minister Blair. Sure. And I'll start with the second first relating to Prime Minister Blair, who, you know, had very much embraced the view of, um, the UK being the US's indispensable ally, I believe the relationship was unique, we wanted to preserve the uniqueness of that relationship and therefore thought it was important to be with, and he used this uh, phrase memorably, I will be with you whatever, uh, in, in a memo to President Bush uh, regarding Iraq. He did want it done the right way. He wanted a coalition. He wanted us to go through the United Nations to get weapons inspectors in. Uh, and, and I should say, by the way, that, that, um, uh, that Blair was not exactly an ally of Saddam Hussein. He saw him as a malevolent character and had long promulgated regime change himself, but wanted it to be done properly. Uh, but um, I think it was a matter of some frustration, both to uh, your old boss, Colin Powell, and uh, two others on the uh, across the pond, uh, that Blair uh, was, not, um, uh, was not sufficiently influential preventing the president from going to war. The question of the coalition was, is a real interesting one because the president certainly welcomed as big a coalition as possible, but uh, was so um, at a certain point um, uh, dead set on going to war that um, uh, that that coalition was going to be limited. He, um, he uh, would invite people like King Abdullah of Jordan into the Oval Office, but, and I have this memorialized in my book, uh, uh, you know, basically say to them, Saddam is a bad character. We must act. History has called us and would not really, he seemed to be internalizing the uh, remarks made by uh, Abdullah and others as well. Okay, I understand it's going to cause you problems back home, but we're concerned about our home, we're our homeland, and, and uh, we want you to be an ally, and if you can't, well, okay. Uh, it's uh, the, the French, the Germans, and the Russians, for reasons of their own, um, uh, uh, were pretty much dead against um, uh, uh, joining the coalition from the start. And ironically, Saddam really believed that they would step in and prevent war. Uh, and so Saddam, all the way up to the last minute, pretty much believed that, that war would not happen. In terms of post-war, uh, there were some contributions. They were limited. And the problem is, is that once it became clear that um, the stability in the country was spinning out of control uh, and, and that had become... Uh, you know, this real danger zone rather than this, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, community of frolicking, joyous democracy lovers, uh, then, um, then uh, far from 
uh, countries wanting to contribute more, those who had signed on to contribute what they could, began to pull back one by one. It was just simply too dangerous. And they, they uh, so many of them, I mean, really only the, um, the Australians and the British uh, uh, supplied combat troops along with the U.S., uh, had been requested to uh, to supply um, their own military force and had passed on that um, because they did not want um, uh, they didn't want to bring back some of their own in body bags for their own country. Now it became even clearer that something like that would happen in the post-war uh, situation of, of chaos and turmoil. And so that I think, as much as anything else, contributed to the reluctance of, of countries to contribute. Mm. Thanks, Robert. We have another question from Mohammed again via YouTube that gets back to something that we had talked about very briefly earlier, and that's Iran. And the question from Mohammed is, was there a plan for managing Iran's interest and involvement or anyone in the U.S. government who was worried about that in the lead up to the war and after Saddam fell? Uh, I, I think the, the short answer to that is no, there was no uniform plan. There was discussion, as you know, Bill, from being in deputies committee meetings about, uh, you know, sort of what about Iran? And there were elements within the Pentagon and, and who had friends outside the Pentagon uh, who were real Iran hawks. Uh, who believed that that perhaps would be the next frontier. Um, uh, but I, I think that there was a gross underestimation of, of um, just um, how much instability would occur in post-war Iraq. And for that matter, uh, what would happen if, um, if the Iraqi army were disbanded, which of course is one of the things that the coalition provisional authority director, um, Jerry Bremer did when he arrived on the scene and that uh, created tens of thousands of unemployed Iraqis who happened to still have their firearms. And that created a kind of um, instability and violence that could only favor Iran. Robert, can you, this is one thing that's always mystified me are those two decisions very early on in the, in the history of the CPA, first to disband the regular military, or at least not to continue to pay the regular military in Iraq, and then the decision on debathification, but especially to put Ahmed Chalabi in, in charge of it. Um, how how was that decision reached as far as your research suggests? In a very unorthodox way. And it's and you know, my book, I think, discloses for the first time a process where um, uh, President Bush was basically briefed that there would be some, but but not deep debathification and that the army would be retained. Um, but Under Secretary for Policy, Doug Fife had other ideas. When Jerry Bremer uh, came to uh, 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 came to Iraq, he carried with him a debathification order uh, that he just simply implemented. And that order had been put together by uh, by Fife, by his lieutenant, Bill Ludy, and others. He also had a disbandment order that had been put together by Fife and uh, uh, an outside advisor named Walt Slocum, who believed that this was a good idea and that a new army of sort of, you know, uh, basically the idea being that, that we wanted to um, purge the army of any kind of bathist element and that we would start the, the army anew. Now, Bremer has said over and over that there was um, that there was no Iraqi army really to disband. That is categorically false. Uh, there are individuals I talked to, both in the military and in the CIA, who were who were in constant dialogue with generals who were providing them with hard drives that had all the names of their troops basically said we know where they are they've stood down for now but the moment you're ready to reconstitute the um uh the troops let us know and uh, so the notion that um there was no army to no band to get back together as it were is simply false mm. another question from unji um who asks about this gets back to a point you made about the u.s army war college study the study the u.s army made of the iraq war and the question is has the military um, or other government agencies learned any sustained lessons from uh, the war in iraq in 2003 but particularly on the army because that was i i agree with you i think that was a, a fascinating and really thoughtful and and as you point out introspective view by the army of what went wrong it's also, you know, I think interesting to note, Bill, that in the Army War College report, they interviewed lots of people for it, including the President of the United States. One person who did not cooperate was the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. And implicitly, he is criticized throughout all of um, that report for having insisted on the, a low-scale invasion force. This was part of Rumsfeld's notion of, of transforming the military, that we could get in and get out with a light footprint, 
uh, this, this was paramount among his objectives, really one of the very few things that I could find that was a true policy that Rumsfeld embraced. And it seemed to go more towards his view that he was smarter than the military bureaucrats and has this kind of updated notion. People warned him about this. They said that the, the model that that had more or less been in effect for, the, um, for Operation Enduring Freedom when we uh, um, uh, invaded Afghanistan in October of 2001 was not applicable to a country of the size and complexity of Iraq, and Rumsfeld simply didn't listen. And uh, I do think that, that uh, the, the Army War College makes absolutely clear that this was among the, the biggest mistakes uh, that the Army intends not to repeat, but implicit in it is like, is, is um, the, you know, we would never have done this, but uh, the Secretary of Defense at the time was absolutely insistent that that be the kind of force that we have to invade. Mm -hmm. Robert, how about the role of another important institution in, in Washington then and now, and that's the U.S. Congress? Um, you know, walk us through a little bit your own impressions. You write about this a lot in the book about the, the role that Congress played in the run up to the war. And, you know, are there lessons that have been absorbed in the way that Congress exercises its authorities about going to war? Sure. I think that, that um, uh, Congress was at that time in the authorization of use for military uh, force vote uh, informed by two events. One of them was 9-11 and another was the first Gulf War. Uh, on 9-11, I, I think a lot of them were plainly freaked out. They didn't know who Al-Qaeda was, many of them. Uh, they, they had their own parochial concerns and they felt that they were invulnerable in Washington, which hadn't been attacked since the early 19th century by the British. So um, the notion that, uh, that uh, the Capitol was uh, not only not impregnable, but had been possibly targeted for attack by the 9-11 hijackers. I think really, really uh, what's concerning, all the more so when the anthrax occurred, uh, anthrax attacks occurred uh, in the Capitol, among other places. Uh, and uh, so they, they felt a heightened sense of vulnerability, which made them correspondingly, I think, lean more into um, the notion of, of war. Uh, it's also the case that throughout the 1990s, um, there had been this discussion, as we were alluding to, regarding Chalabi, about uh, you know the um, Saddam as an evil man, Saddam as a threat, and so I think that habituated them more to the idea of, of of going to war. But I mentioned another factor, and that was the 1991 Gulf War. A lot of these people who were on the Hill for the 2002 vote had been there in the 1991 vote. Back then, their informed view, their experience regarding wars was Vietnam, which was, in their view, a quagmire, and a lot of them didn't vote for it. And a lot of the people who wanted to run for higher political office didn't vote for it. When that war, the Gulf War, ended in 100 hours and, and was a true mission accomplished moment, a lot of them had second thoughts. The, the, the belief was that Sam Nunn, uh, his presidential prospects were basically uh, strangled in their crib as a result of his having voted um, uh, against the Gulf War. And so a lot of other people with political aspirations were not going to make the same mistake that Burns did, or that, not Burns, that, that, uh, uh, that Sam Nunn had done. Robert, another um, question from one of our viewers from Darren via YouTube is about a, another important institution, but outside the U.S. government, that's the United Nations. And Darren's question is, can you talk about Kofi Annan and the role of the U.N. in the lead up to the war? Sure. I mean, the, the, um, it was the, the short version of this is that it was limited, but not not because of not for lack of desire on the part of, of Kofi Annan and the UN. Um, the, the, the UN being an international body had very differing views regarding Iraq, but for the most part, um, the view was that war should be avoided. And um, uh, and when um, uh, President Bush was seeking a second resolution after the first resolution that allowed the weapons to go in, he found very, very few takers. Uh, part of this was that, that uh, the president, but I'd say more prominently the vice president, um, uh, just didn't altogether trust the United Nations, thought they had become like this debating society, and thought that their weapons inspectors were credulous and perhaps incompetent, perhaps even corrupt. Uh, and uh, there were people within the administration who repeatedly voiced that view. And so when uh, when there was this constant, you know, trying to trying to find allies within the coalition through the UN, while at the same time these UN inspectors led by Hans Blix are wandering through Iraq and not finding anything, uh, which if you were of the view, if you were confident as Bush and Cheney were that there were weapons to be found, only proves then that this is a waste of time, that, that this is just a slow rolling and that people in the UN are just trying to do all they can to stall the chances of war 
And of course, there was, in a sense, a clock. There was a there was a real concern that we would that that if we invaded uh, by say summertime, uh, the um, it would be incredibly hot. Uh, the desert sands would become you know a quagmire of their own. And so Bush's native impatience, coupled with that coupled with a belief that the UN was really not interested in getting anything done, but had its own anti-war agenda, ultimately conspired to have Bush more or less push them aside at the end. Mm. But I know we're running out of time, Robert, and, and, and thanks again for a fascinating conversation and a terrific book. But let me ask one last question, just to follow mm. up on that, about something you also write about um, quite a bit in the book, and that's the role of the inspectors as well. You know, an impossible task in many respects, navigating Saddam Hussein's Iraq, but talk a little bit about the role that that they played throughout this. Sure, yeah, no, I think if you're looking for heroes in this tale, they come the closest to it. And, and uh, uh, I think that, that the ground truth that was provided by Hans Blitz's team um, was was really the the first you know, the, the first close glimpse, of course, we, we just simply didn't believe what we were seeing or rather what we were not seeing. Uh, we, we were believing that, that Saddam was obfuscating, that his government was delaying, and they really were not. Um, they, they were never standing in the way and keeping us from uh, uh, from inspecting various sites. Um, uh, they um, uh, There were certain people in the Bush administration who were insistent that the, that uh, the inspectors be able to fly um, Iraqi scientists and even their families out of the country and interrogate them. And that was never done, but it also was never really necessary. Of course, again, if you are of the belief that Saddam is hiding something for sure, and then Blix is not finding anything, that can only prove to you that this is, this is all a charade. But what was happening was that after, for example, Powell's UN speech, where Powell was citing specific sites not only um, had some of those sites been already visited by the weapons inspectors, and they knew for a fact, as my book details, that there was nothing there to be seen, but then they went back um, on orders of, of, um, of Blix and of his deputies and again inspected those sites as well as other sites that were mentioned in Powell's speech. And the weapons that, that uh, he said with such confidence were in there somewhere were nowhere to be found, nor were there, there any trace of them. So, you know, the, it's, you could argue that, that um, the inspectors really you know play this heroic role but instead in a way uh, I, I think that they underscore the helplessness of people who are trying to trying to announce the truth uh, to ears that were deaf to minds that were made up well thanks Robert um, I, I want to thank you again so much for a great discussion and for a brilliant book um, the, the book again is to start a war how the Bush administration took America into Iraq and I urge all of you to read it because there's a lot to learn and a lot of lessons to absorb and and a lot of wonderful writing to enjoy as well. So, Robert, thank you so much again, and thank you all for joining. Thank you, Bill. Really appreciate it.